Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation. My name is Fred Kuntz. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs at CG. Tonight is the latest in our regular series of public events, the CG Signature Lecture Series. We'd like to acknowledge CG's public event sponsors, which are 570 News and Wordsworth Books. Thank you for your support. Besides the full house for our audience here tonight at the CGM, CG Atrium in Waterloo, and, and thank you all for coming despite the inclement weather, uh, we also have a global audience who are watching via the live webcast available anywhere in the world that has the internet. And speaking of global impact, our topic tonight is the dark side of globalization. Seen by some as a desirable engine of prosperity and progress, globalization is resisted by others as a soft underbelly of a corporate imperialism that plunders and profiteers in the global marketplace. Globalization has brought many benefits, including the reduction of poverty in some countries, but it also has a dark side, the unleashing of negative forces, including transnational flows of terrorism, drug and human trafficking, organized crime, money laundering, and global pandemics. Our topic is inspired by a book of the same name, The Dark Side of Globalization, co-edited by CG's own Jorge Heine, and that brings me to our distinguished panel. Allow me to introduce them, and then I'll turn it over to them. Jorge Heine, who you've been watching on the overhead screen just before tonight's presentation, is both our moderator for the evening and also an informed participant in the conversation. He is a CG Distinguished Fellow, CG Chair of Global Governance at the Balsley School of International Affairs, and Professor of Political Science at Wilfrid Laurier University. He was previously Ambassador of Chile to India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, and Ambassador to South Africa, as well as a Cabinet Minister and Deputy Minister in the Chilean Government. A lawyer and political scientist, he's been a visiting fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and a research associate at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C., and has many other accomplishments to his name. Next to Jorge, we have William Coleman, a CG Chair in Globalization and Public Policy at the Balsley School of International Affairs, and a contributor to the book we've mentioned. Dr. Coleman is a professor of political science and was the founding director of the Institute on Globalization and the Human Condition at McMaster University. He's received several distinguished honors during his academic career, including being named as a fellow by the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. And finally, we are honored to have with us John Ralston Saul, award-winning essayist and novelist and co-chair of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship. John Ralston Saul, a longtime champion of freedom of expression, was elected president of Penn International in 2009. Declared a prophet by Time magazine, he's included in the prestigious Sydney Reader's list of the world's 100 leading thinkers and visionaries. His works have been translated into 22 languages in 30 countries. He's received many national and international awards for his writing, most recently South Korea's Manhai Grand Prize for Literature. He's the editor of the extraordinary Canadian series of books, 18 uh, biographies, including uh, most recently his own book uh, on La Fontaine and Baldwin. And in his 2005 book, The Collapse of Globalism and the Reinvention of the World, Saul warns that, like it or not, globalism was already collapsing and that if we did not act quickly, we'd be caught in a crisis and limited to emergency reactions. You can find copies of this book on sale here tonight in the lobby, along with the book that Jorge co-edited. And so with that, I now turn it over to our panelists, uh, Jorge. Good evening. Thank you, Fred, for that introduction. And thank you all for coming and braving the elements of the snowy winter evening. As Jay Leno would say, the weather is so bad, so bad, that I couldn't even get my wife to come here. So I'm very impressed with this, with this turnout. Um, you may have heard the phrase that opposing globalization is a bit like opposing the sun coming up every morning and about as fruitful. And there is something to it, obviously. Um, being against globalization in today's world, according to some people, is tilting at windmills like a modern day Don Quixote. But the issue I would posit to you is a bit more, is a bit more complicated than that. At the risk of simplifying a much more complex debate, 
I would like to put to you to introduce the topic tonight that basically there are two big schools of thought on globalization. One of them is to say that it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And we should welcome it, we should embrace it, we should do whatever globalization tells us because kingdom will come and we will be happy forever. There's another school of thought that in some ways proved its mettle in the so-called Battle of Seattle in 1999, which opposes this kind of globalization. And we saw some manifestations of that in July in Toronto uh, on the occasion of the G20 summit. In the book that we are launching today, The Dark Side of Globalization, the product of a conference held here at CG, we stake out a middle ground between these two very different and extreme schools of thought. We acknowledge that globalization has brought much progress to many parts of the world. You look at the numbers of poverty reduction in China and in India uh, over the past 30 years, it's really quite remarkable. But there's also an underside. There is a dark side to globalization. What we explore in the book is how many of the very same things that allow these increased flows of goods, services, culture, capital to go largely unimpeded throughout the world also open possibilities for mischief makers and for people who want to do bad and naughty things. This leads us, of course, to one of the central, if not the central mandate of CG, that is the issue of global governance. The way we see it and the argument we develop in the book is that the issue and the problem, as it were, is not so much with globalization per se, by which we refer to the increased flows uh, in goods, services, capital, cultural products that we have seen since 1980. You know, my students often ask me if we had to put a date down on globalization. I would put 1980. Why 1980? 1980 was the year in which both CNN and the first PC came on the market. So it compresses nicely both the IT dimension and the telecommunications dimension of it. Since then, what we have seen is how a number of people in, say, drug smuggling, in um, the trafficking of, of human beings, in um, arms trafficking, have taken advantage of the enormous possibilities offered by these newly emerging tools and uh, technological systems that have brought the world closer together, but have also allowed some of these things to go on. And it gives me very special pleasure to share the, this podium today with two such distinguished speakers as noted author John Ralston Saul and Professor Will Coleman from the University of Waterloo and my colleague at the Balsili School of International Affairs. I'm seeing quite a lot of Will these days. Today we spend much of the morning for our sins going through applications for the doctoral program at the Balsili School. The good news is that we're getting many applications from all over the world. The bad news is that somebody has to go through them, and uh, so we are two of the people that have to, that have to do that. And uh, Will is uh, a very noted IR specialist and one of the co-authors of the book, and will share his perspectives accordingly. But let me say also that I'm particularly delighted to have John Ralston Saul here with us. It so happens that a few years ago, I think it was in 2006, I attended the launch of the first edition of his book, The Collapse of Globalism and the Reinvention of the World, in New Delhi at the Canadian High Commission, one of the most splendid embassy residences in Lucien's Delhi, a true architectural gem, when I was ambassador of Chile to India. We got to talk. He told me that he is a great friend of Chile. We promised to keep in touch, but you know, we've run into each other a couple of times at various Toronto events, but haven't really followed up. But what goes around comes around, and five years after that encounter in Delhi, we meet in Waterloo this time for the launch of, of a book of mine. I suppose we should stop meeting this way and perhaps get together socially 
in between book launches, as it were, and midway between Delhi and Waterloo, a place like Cape Town, I think, would do nicely, one of my favorite cities. And without further ado, I leave with you John Rawson Saul, author, thinker, and man of letters extraordinaire. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Murray. It, it, uh, I do love Chile, and I've been talking to a lot of people in Chile recently. Um, Antonio Scarmata, uh, who's one of the great novelists and a former ambassador. And, uh, and I don't know if you know, but actually, this is, I never say this, but actually the best thing that's happened to me in the last seven or eight years was I was given the Pablo Neruda medal. You know, if you're a, a, a philosophical political essayist and they give you a medal named after the greatest poet of the 20th century in Spanish, you feel really good, particularly when you can't write poetry yourself at all. It, uh, it's very nice. Anyway, it's great to be back here, and it's great to be back here with you and with William Coleman, and I've read a good part of the book. It's a very interesting book, and I think it's an attempt to get at some of the things that are confusing people, troubling people, worrying people. And I, so I think it's a very valuable book, and it, it tells you that, you know, we're, we're moving on to more interesting ground. Uh, ten years ago, we weren't on this interesting ground in terms of talking about uh, what's uh, globalization. And I first started talking about what I would call the end of globalization in 99 in public in Australia. And I published this book in 2005. And then after the sort of official end of globalization a couple of years ago, um, I added another chapter to the book, to, which is sort of a I told you so chapter. But it's an attempt to, to, to give a sense to what has been happening over the last couple of years and what it might mean and where it might be uh, leading us. To me, I think what's really important is to say, first of all, that I think you quite rightly already talked about these two schools. And I'm not sure I would say that you put yourself in the middle. I would say you stood back and taken another look at the whole thing. I don't think you need to put yourself on that pendulum in the middle. I think it's quite interesting that you're outside the pendulum, and I think that's what's so interesting about it. And I think that my position has always been that I'm outside the pendulum in another kind of way. Um, I don't think, first of all, that globalization is principally about neoconservatism. That's just a, a silly little economic idea that never made any sense. It's sort of a, a justification for profiteering. Um, and I think what you could really say globalization is, is an attempt to move this, the prism, the way we look at civilization. You know, with the times when you look at it through the church and through God, or you look through an absolute monarch, or you look at it through uh, one or other uh, interest groups, um, and, or, or an ideology of some sort. Well, the ideology of the 20th century was that you had to look at the world through economics, the second half of the 20th century. And that was called globalization, which is basically you come at everything in the world through economics, and that that uh, shapes the way you think about citizens who become clients. Uh, it's the way you come at... Uh, culture, in terms of organizing and funding or controlling culture, and on, and, or health care. You know, you walk into a hospital and nobody's sick. You know, they're clients, and it's all talked about as if they were somehow objects within an economic theory, management theory, and when you trace it all back, you can trace it back to three or four things. One of them is sort of Taylorism, uh, but an, another one of the key things you can trace it back to is this utilitarian view of how the world works and is inevitably going to work, which came to be called um, globalization. Uh, I think that one of the odd things about the whole movement was that it, 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 it was basically presented as something of the future, inevitable and of the future, whereas in fact it's basically a 19th century, mid-19th century economic theory. They took two 19th century economic theories, free trade and rogue capitalism, and glued the two together and said, isn't this brilliant? But of course, they're opposites. So it was inevitably going to produce problems, explosions, good things as well, just as rogue capitalism and free trade have produced good things. But putting the two together was going to produce things like an, uh, unintended effects with the drug trade or 
uh, guerrilla armies or you know, a, whole, a long list of problems that have come out of it. Um, but I think at the heart of it, what I'm saying is that, that the, 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 the dark side of capitalism is that it is not a new idea. It isn't an original idea. It's an old idea. And it's tied to a linear view of how civilization works. So it's very much tied into the old rational and then utilitarian view of how you move from the past into the future and you never go backwards. You know, that's progress is moving forward. And that globalization was this sort of economic, utilitarian, linear moving forward, tied to very old fashioned ideas of growth. You actually examine the ideas of growth which are tied to the discourse around globalization and you find that they're just very, very outdated approaches towards growth and what new wealth is and how things expand. And it's this idea that you just keep growing, you just keep expanding. There'll just be more and more trade without really examining whether you need more trade. There's nothing wrong with trade. But you, without examining what kind of trade, what circumstances for the trade, what is the purpose of the trade, does it actually get us what we want? Um, and this sort of linear approach produces a very, what I would call non-inclusive, non, uh, not an overview, not a big picture. It's a very narrow picture of how the world works, utilitarian. And so it breaks off, you know, citizenship and um, the public good, the idea of the disinterested citizen, the idea of civilizations. Um, and you, 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 in fact, it's been leading us away from precisely what we needed, which was a holistic or an inclusive or a larger view of things. It's very much, it's very, very similar the last 30 years to the atmosphere that reigned in France under Louis Philippe give you a precise example. I was a very Louis Philippard, which, you know, it had some real advantages, but it, in the end, really didn't work out. And it certainly has never been about capitalism, uh, because it's largely been about the return of mercantilism, which is to say the creation of large, horizontally integrated uh, bodies, corporations, which are basically owned, not owned, but controlled by managers, nothing to do with capitalism at all, really large transnationals. Really, they resemble the Hudson's Bay Company or the British East India Company. And they're not about creating wealth. They're about moving products into increasingly constructed forms around the world. Um, it uh, isn't, certainly, has not been about increased competition. If anything, it's, it's been a period in a falling away of competition and the rise of an increasing number of oligopies oligopolies and monopolies. And it hasn't been really about opening borders in any real sense. Certainly the last 20 years has been about a thickening of border and a closing down of borders. And you can see every time you travel that the borders are thickening. They're thickening and they're thickening and thickening. So you're getting things like a European region, if it can hold together, a North American region. But this is the opposite of what was promised. But all of this is about an economic theory of the world. And so all of these other things that are happening in the world, good and bad, aren't about globalization. They're about other forms of internationalism. There is a perfectly good word to describe things that cross borders, internationalism. Globalization is a specific word applying to a specific school, a specific ideology, if you like, of how to run the world. Now, the only thing I disagree with slightly in the book is one of the things that you said in the introduction, which is that the main problem is a problem of governance. And of course, it is a problem of governance. I agree. But I think underneath it, it's... Yes. <laughs> so there's a big problem of governance, and we need to handle the governance problem. But there's an even bigger problem, which is a problem of theory, a problem of idea, ideas, a problem of imagination, of why are we doing this? What is this for? Where does this lead? What is the purpose of it? And I think that's where there has been a big failure, the absence of, 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 uh, of inclusive approaches to the way we do things. That's the heart of the governance problem is this utilitarian, linear, narrow approach which breaks everything out and makes the idea of governance impossible. And that's why you could say, on the one hand, people talking endlessly about growth and the key element of trade in growth, and then you actually examine what's happened, 
and you find that in the 1970s you had six times more currency for, uh, c compared to real goods being traded, and in 1995 you're up to 50 times, and God knows what you're at today. I don't know if you know what the number is. I would imagine it's 70 or 100 times more. This, this is not growth. This is not wealth creation. This is inflation. This is the South Sea bubble. So that's what you saw two years ago, was a kind of breaking of that bubble. But then the, the structure, the ideology is so strong, the, the, posi the positioning of the people who believe in it is so strong that they still, they just continued on with the same system as if it didn't really matter. Um, they should have lanced the boil and moved on, which was what we've always done historically when there are financial bubbles. Instead of that, they tripled the problem by pretending that they could mend it by not lancing the boil. And so they've done brilliant things like moving enormous amounts of private debt into the public domain. You know, that's what was done in Ireland. It was private debt and they made it public debt. And then, having made it public debt, you then turn around and say, you see, we told you governments were inefficient. And we got to do away with those public programs. I mean, that's essentially um, what was done. And blaming the governments for the errors of this theory. And of course the governments are to blame in the sense that they have been part of the buy-in of the last 30 years. So let me just wind up this, this sort of little introduction by saying that I, I think that to a great extent, because it's a problem of ideas, it's therefore a problem of leadership and a problem of education and a problem of elites. Um, there was a great uh, Algerian, it's pre-Algeria, but Algerian thinker and leader and religious figure and military leader called Abdel Kader, uh, 19th century. And he said that what, what was needed always was the great jihad. And the great jihad is not at all what most people think it is. He said the great jihad is the struggle against uncontrolled emotion. And that's pretty close to what the Koran says. Uh, and of course, in a way, you could say that this, this very narrow utilitarian 19th century view of how to run the world can only be pushed forward on the basis of uncontrolled emotion, unintellectualism, a lack of education, a lack of intelligent thinking about how the world works, and a refusal of modernity, a terrible refusal of modernity. So, that's why you're seeing so few new ideas coming out of government. That's why a place like this is important, because it actually is devoting itself to trying to think about how to do things in the world. But most universities aren't doing that. And frankly, most of the elites, government, university, private sector, and so on, the reason they've reacted so ineptly to the problems of globalization is because they're classical degenerates. You know, when people, you know, the, in the 70s, you had first generation believers in globalization. Now you're into third, fourth, fifth generation. <laughs> These are people who were completely educated inside the absolute truth put forward in the 1970s about globalization and how it works. They've never had anybody disagree with them inside the structures. They've never been taught the basics of, uh, you know, if you have an idea, there's probably another idea that isn't the same as yours. It doesn't mean they're wrong, it means you should be discussing it. And they spent an enormous amount of time, many of these people in universities, making sure that they weren't disagreed with, so that we saw the equivalent of an ethnic cleansing, an intellectual cleansing over the last 30 years in the economics department, which meant that no new ideas were coming up. We'd never seen departments of economics with so few disagreements within them. They're starting to come now because the problems are so obvious. But we went through three decades without serious argument inside the departments of economics, literally with people who disagreed not being published in the, in the journals and so on, shutting the argument down. You know, and this is classic ideology, classic refusal of the value of intellectual thought, of intellectual difference, that through difference you discover new things. They, actually developed something which is the exact equivalent of what the Catholic Church once called the Sacred Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith, which is a propaganda arm in favor of an ideology pretending to be a science of economics. And the servants of the faith, well, the servants of the faith, the intellectual class, has come in four categories. First, 
the professors of economics, 95%, in absolute agreement, eliminating the people who weren't in agreement, cleansing the altar of alternate ideas, using microeconomics as a, a way of pretending that they were thinking, you know. Uh, doing away with the history of economics, University of Toronto basically did away with it, thereby promoting mid-level thought, macroeconomics, up to the top, and then promoting microeconomics up to the middle, thereby leaving us with a sort of economic structure which eliminated the possibility of real doubt and thought. The second group was the business schools, where, as you know, more and more and more money has been spent on management schools, management theory, promoting utilitarian and linear ideas of inevitability, and confusing everybody totally, because they say we have a problem of leadership, therefore we need more managers. We should all be rolling on the floor laughing. Management isn't leadership. Leadership is leadership, management is management. It's the level below. And the last 30 years, the years of globalization has been a kind of refusal of intellectualism done in the universities through the promotion of A, these junior level economists to the top level and the promotion of mere managers to theoretical thinkers. The third group, of course, has been what comes out of that, which is the, um, the propagandists. And you could call this the consulting industry, I guess. You know, the consultants who basically come out of the management schools and the departments of economics. And then the fourth have been the economic journalists and columnists, who of course are just taking the crumbs off the table of the first three groups. And this represents a catastrophic breakdown of Western intellectual thought, which has led us so far down the road of what's called globalization without there being serious thought about, well, is this inclusive enough? Does this take into account things other than old-fashioned 19th century economics? It's like, it's as if we've fallen into low-level medieval scholasticism, frankly. I would say that what we've had in terms of economic thought over the last 30 years is the lowest level of education and intellectual thought since about 1750, when Voltaire used to say that the aristocracy who were in charge didn't know how to read, they could hire people who could read. Sort of the equivalent of that. So all of this is to say that that it's very healthy when you see a book like yours coming out because it shows that it's broken down enough that people are starting to ask real questions. But asking the questions is only the first step. We're a very long way away from people saying, well, actually, why would 19th century theories of growth be what we need today? Surely there are other ideas out there, and there are a few great economists who come out with some other ideas, but they're still seriously marginalized. Why can't we have theories of production which are not simply about growth? Why can't we have theories of production which are somehow about the other elements of society? And why would we have economic theories which actually pretend to be in favor of democracy but in fact shove the role of the citizen to the margins? So all of this you're hearing from somebody who, as you heard, is published in 22 countries and believes in trade and has always made his career internationally. Um, and I'll just finish with this. Um, in mid-December, as president of Penn, I was in uh, Cairo uh, for a meeting of all the African Penn centers. And what's interesting, of course, about the intellectual world is that it's always been international. It's never been about globalism. It's always been international. And books have always been international, and translation has always been international. So there I was in Africa, with, in, in Africa, in Cairo, with writers from 20-odd countries, and uh, <coughs> going to see Amr Musa for Penn, the head of the uh, Arab League, and so on. And what was fascinating was, you, you asked, uh, the other reason I was there was that my book, The Collapse of Globalism, had just come out the year before in Arabic. And to my enormous surprise, won a big prize, and it's it's a big success throughout the Arab-speaking world. And everywhere I went in Cairo, what everybody said to me, we love your book. I think they were misinterpreting it. But I love your, we love your book because it's so anti-globalization and we're so anti-globalization. And, and actually what's fascinating is that the fall of Mubarak, the fall of Ben Ali, what you're seeing there is to a great extent one of the expressions 
of the failure of globalization as an international theory. Now, whether their interpretation is right or wrong, the point is they were told by their governments, they were told by the experts from the World Bank and, and so on, by the professors, that this, what they had to do, bang, 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 was all about globalization. And therefore, they came to identify the poverty, the dictatorship, the uh, unhappiness of their societies with globalization. Not because they made that up, but because that's what we told them it was all about. And I thought that's really interesting because that's not, you know, I wouldn't have thought walking into Cairo that people would explain a dictatorship like Mubarak's by saying, well, we were always told that this was about globalization and it had to be that way. And now it's all being overthrown, which is just one more sign of this falling apart of a movement born out of the middle of the 19th century and brought to power for the first time in the late 1970s. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. That was a tour de force, as they say. And now I'll leave, now leave with you Professor Will Coleman. Well, I think you better be careful. I'm a professor from university. <laughs> and uh, maybe I've been living in a stale environment. <laughs> it's not true, by the way, that economists don't argue about things. I've been at uh, economic seminars where they've argued for half an hour over a mathematical formula. <laughs> um, one of the challenges that uh, social scientists like myself have um, is that some of the terms that we use in our thinking and our teaching are also words that are used in society every day. So for example, as a political scientist, I'm pretty interested in something called democracy. And, and political theorists and other people have written about democracy, and so we have an idea of what, from an academic perspective, democracy is. But then, you pay attention to the media and you see that words like democracy are thrown around all the time. But they may not mean the same thing as we mean by them because they have a different purpose. They're part of a rhetoric, they're part of telling a story. So the challenge that we have with something like globalization is that it's one of those terms. It's one of those terms that has a whole series of different meanings when people talk about it in the press, in politics, in their living rooms, whatever. And it has another life, and that's in academic discussions. And this book that we're talking about tonight, a little bit, The Dark Side of Globalization, kind of relates to that second academic part of globalization. So globalization becomes for us a tool. It's, a, it's an analytical tool, it's a way to help us understand what exactly is it that's changing about the world in which we're living. Can some notion of globalization help us understand it? And many of the authors in this book, we think so. And we think that it'll understand some of the good things, but also some of the bad things, a little bit differently. So when you hear the word globalization, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is it? Well, globalization is a word, regionalization, lots of words like that. It's referring to a process. Something's going on. And what is it that's going on? Well, academics never agree on anything. So they've debated this question now, I think, for almost 20 years. But I'll give you a simple definition of what they say is going on. It'll seem a little empty for a moment, but maybe I can fill in a little bit. So you can see how it might become an analytical tool for us. And after I do that, I'll talk a little bit about my own chapter in this book. But before I do that, I also want to thank CG, not only for holding uh, this meeting here tonight, but for sponsoring a conference of scholars from around the world who think analytically about globalization. It's called the Globalization Studies Network. And that global conference took place right here where you're sitting, uh, two years ago in 2008. And in one of those panels that we had at that um, 
that meeting was about the dark side of globalization, and Professor Heine and a colleague put some of those papers together, and that's how this book came about. So we have a double thank you to CG, not only for allowing us to talk about the book tonight, but really for helping a group of people come together to talk about some of the ideas that went into the book. So, what is globalization? So let me say something. This is going to sound academic, but you've got to pardon me. You know, I've been academic for 32 years. It's the growth of transplanetary connections between people. So what we're talking about is relationships between people. But what's different about them is they're transplanetary. That is, they're connections that can take place between two people in any part of the world. And then usually people add a separate little clause to that definition. They say the growth of transplanetary connections among people, an increasing number of which are, another academic word coming, I warn you, supraterritorial. And supraterritorial is, a, is an academic way for telling you that those connections are much less easily controlled by the physical place and boundaries of the countries in which you live. That the connections we can make between people are more easily taking place without worrying about national borders. And let me give you a little example to illustrate what I'm talking about. Let's look back a month ago when all of the conflict was going on, and it's still going on in some ways, in the country of Tunisia. Now, what was interesting from that point of view, I suppose, as Canadians watching that, is we saw that the Tunisian population in Ottawa, in Montreal, in Toronto, was mobilized. <coughs> Not only were they mobilized, they were connected. They were connected directly electronically to the people in the streets in Tunisia. And it wasn't just in Canada. Anywhere around the world where the Tunisian diaspora exists, they were connected. So that's what I mean by transplanetary connections. The possibility of being connected between people any part of the world. It doesn't mean it always takes place that way. And the possibility that governments, states, may not be able to control it all that well. So that's the kind of analytical thinking that we had in going into this book. Now when we look at these transplanetary connections, usually what they're about is movement. They could be moving goods and services. Trade. So maybe moving um, oranges from Jorge's country of Chile to us up here in Canada, where we don't have any orange trees and we like some fresh oranges in the winter, might be seen as good side. But the same kind of globalizing processes in terms of moving goods and services could also involve moving illegal weapons. It can also talk about the movement of people. So that we can talk about the movement of people, immigration, we can talk about people being able to travel and move to, and, and go to virtually any part of the world because of the advances in transportation technologies, the good side. Or we could talk about sex trafficking, the trafficking of women from all parts of the world to other parts of the world. We could talk about the movement of money. There's all kinds of money that goes on exchanging between stock exchanges and so on and so forth every day. And that's probably all right, depending upon your position. But there's also all kinds of money laundering that's taking place. There's a movement of ideas. It becomes easier for ideas to move to different parts of the world. For people in China to actually discuss perhaps democracy in some way and ask how it fits in their situation than it might have been in the past. We can also talk about the movement of cultural practices. Some of those might be good, some of them might be bad. Certainly the movement of music, for example, and the exchanges that take place across the world in terms of music and listening to music and exchanging music is an aspect of globalization. But we can also look at the movement of certain cultural practices that are less, less useful, less helpful. So when we're talking about globalization, we're using it in this analytical way. And when we're talking about the dark side of globalization, what we're interested in is people remembering that the same processes that seem to be doing good things, like moving uh, 
uh, oranges from Chile to Canada, if you assume it's good, and there are some people who disagree with it, uh, is also a process that's making it easier to move women and children, traffic them all over the globe. Now, when we begin then to, to think about globalization in this way, when we came together in the book, we were interested in what kinds of situations in the world are not being well understood, but that are being made possible by globalization. And there are organizations, of course, that work very well with globalization. Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is a global network. It fits that definition of globalization, the growth of transplanetary connections, some of which is super-territorial, pretty well. Because it's very difficult for government, governments, as we've seen, to contain a movement like that. So in the book, we were interested in those particular things. Now I'd like to spend a few minutes just talking about my own chapter. Because Jorge asked me to do a little bit of that. <laughs> and as, as uh, was mentioned in the introduction, I set up an institute in globalization and the human condition at McMaster University, my former employer, in 1998. And we had a master's program in globalization studies, so I taught globalization, taught about globalization for a number of years. And one of the questions that we find if you begin reading what scholars read about globalization is, what is the relationship between globalization and imperialism? What is the relationship between globalization and empires? And the reason why that question came up is because after the first flourish of discussions of globalization in the early 1990s, historians, always very helpful people to have in the academy, put up their hand and said, uh, wait a minute, are you sure there's something new about this? Weren't there transplanetary connections being made in the 19th century, even the 18th century? What is it that's different about today? And in, the, in articulating and making that discussion, they said empires. Take the British Empire. It was forging a, connections right across the globe between people for the British interest. And so some of the discussion of uh, contemporary globalization is, well, is Contemporary globalization also associated at all with imperialism. And when that question comes up, the next actual question that people have is, well, isn't imperialism gone? And some people say, yeah, that ended with the end of the British Empire. Other people say, well, what about the United States of America? Isn't that an imperial country? And then people would say, well, it doesn't look quite like the British Empire. And then people would say, well, what about their economic power? What about their capacity to push and promote their way of doing things economically around the world? Isn't that an example of imperialism? And people would answer, well, <coughs> I'm not sure. And then people would say, well, it's more than soft power, you know. Soft power is a term they mean that you don't really take a gun and say, adopt my economy. You say, if you don't adopt my economic way of doing things, maybe we won't trade with you. Or maybe we won't do something else that you like. Maybe we'll raise visas for people coming from your country if you, if you don't get along with us. So that debate about the United States became and ent entered into the globalization discussion. Because people were asking, how do we understand the position of the United States in the contemporary world of globalization, which, is, as, uh, as our previous speaker has said, has seen the globalization of a particular set of economic ideas that we call neoliberalism. And those originated in the United States and in the United Kingdom, with the victory of Margaret Thatcher in 1979 and Ronald Reagan in 1980 in terms of political agendas. And it was at that point, so I've taught about that. I raised that question with my students, we debated. And then about four summers ago, I came across two books. 
One was called Blowback, and the other one was called The Sorrows of Empire. And I looked at the author, I said, these look like radical, kind of strange books, those titles. Who's the author? And much to my surprise, the author was a man by the name of Chalmers Johnson. And Chalmers Johnson was someone I knew as a professional political scientist. At least I knew his work. He had been a specialist in Chinese and Japanese industrial policy. I would read his books in the 1980s when I was studying Canadian industrial policy. <coughs> and I thought, this doesn't sound like the Chalmers Johnson. Is this the right person? Because he was a very traditional political scientist was not on the left. As a matter of fact, I would call him conservative, reading his work and his understanding, at least, of Japanese industrial policy. So I, I didn't quite, it didn't quite fit with me. Why was Chalmers Johnson writing these books? And then I ran, read a little bit more. And some of you may remember in 1995, on the island of Okinawa, Japan, a 12-year-old Japanese girl was raped by a U.S. soldier on the island of Okinawa. And for many of the islanders, that was kind of the last straw. And they rioted. They demonstrated, and thousands of, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people demonstrated for a number of days running. So Mr. Clinton, who was then the President of the United States, said, we've got a problem here. And usually, as you know, all politicians like to solve problems by sending, setting up investigations, royal commissions we have in Canada. And so he put together an investigatory commission. And he wanted someone who knew Japan very well. And as I said, Mr. Uh, Chalmers Johnson, Dr. Don Chalmers Johnson was a leading expert. He taught East Asian politics in political science at the University of California, Berkeley. He went there as part of this investigation commission. He looked around and he said, why is it today in 1995, 50 years after the Second World War is over, six years after the end of the Cold War, we have 38 military bases on the island of Okinawa? Why is that, he said. And he became disturbed by that, that finding, and he began to think about it. And the one thing that was characteristic of Professor Johnson's work as a political scientist, he was a very thorough researcher. He left no stone unturned. You could always be certain that his work was very well thought out and well researched. And so the first thing he did <clears throat> was investigate, well, how many military bases does the United States have around the world? And it turns out they have about 900. That, I'm talking here about military bases outside the continental United States. And why I became interested in this work, because he then articulated, well, there is an empire here, but it's an empire that's based upon military bases. So, in talking about globalization, which is what I was interested in, he said it's, it's still like those older empires, but it's a little bit different. Although not completely different. Because another thing he discovered, that in 90 of the countries that have those bases, those countries have secretly signed what he calls a uh, standard of forces agreement. Which basically says that on the land occupied by the U.S. military, it isn't our land. It is American soil. So in essence, the bases become almost mini colonies. So in this particular uh, thinking, he then went a little bit further and he found that the United States had divided the world into six regions and each one had a commander in chief who was a military person. He also discovered that if you look at US embassies around the world, now <laughs> over 50% of the people in those embassies are military. And finally, he looked at military spending, and in an article he published in Le Monde Diplomatique in 2008, he found that there was 
nine, $690 billion spent by the United States on military equipment, etc., in a year. And the rest of the world spent a little over $400 billion. So $600 billion for the United States, four hundred, a little over $400 billion for the rest of the countries of the world. And so what I'm trying to say is that, from my point of view, is that just an illustration of the kind of issue that we try to raise in this book, is this the dark side of globalization? Because I'm again talking about transcontinental uh, connections between people. But they're of a very particular kind which is a military connections based upon bases that are themselves implanted in, in different parts of the world. And then we can ask the question, well, if that is the case, what about those problems with 19th century imperialism, where people were looked down upon and subjected and criticized and seemed to be inferior if they weren't, right, if they weren't uh, part of the same group, and so on. So, that, that's the kind of question then that really comes up in the book, but in a variety of different ways. Most of the scholars in the book uh, come from the Global South, because the Globalization Studies Network that set up the, the, uh, the uh, conference uh, helped bring those scholars here. And so they're looking at globalization from, if you like, that particular part and that particular uh, situation in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Will. Very interesting. The, um, you might have heard some years ago uh, the notion of the end of history that was put forward by uh, Francis Fukuyama. And you know, some people thought that was a bit premature. But what we really have seen over the past 30 years, as I mentioned earlier, is in some ways the end of geography as we had known it. Uh, the sort of interplanetary connections that Professor Colbert alluded to are precisely that. And again, you know, there are two. Sorry. Uh, there are two very different ways of of looking at this, and one of is to say, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. We had this in the 19th century, we had this perhaps in the 18th century. And another is to say, well, the technology that we have today, and which allows us to webcast this panel discussion all over the world, has introduced not just a quantitative, but a qualitative change in the way we interact with our environment. And in that sense, it seems to me, what we have before us is something quite dramatically new and, and distinct. And I think I would add to this, the notion of the transplanetary connections, the notion of flows. I think what we have is an extraordinary amount of an increase in flows of capital, of goods, of services. But there is, of course, one exception. And this is why um, it is you know, somewhat unbalanced. It is of people. As uh, John mentioned earlier, uh, when one travels, one finds it, I'm sure all of you do as well, that the obstacles are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, my, my favorite story in this regard that I've used a number of times, there was this um, woman lawyer attending a conference in Toronto and she had a, a baby child back in San Diego uh, and so she had some of her mother's milk that she had uh, retrieved through some of these modern devices that didn't exist in my time and was carrying it with her uh, and before getting on the plane it was taken away from her because it was considered something that would endanger um, the passengers of the plane, who knows what she might want to do with it. Now, 
when we reach that level of paranoia, you will realize that there is a problem and there's something uh, deeply, deeply wrong. Now, the other point that is important to, to keep in mind is that we have these, these flows that have brought progress to many areas and to many countries. But they also, what they have also done is to increase inequality. What we have is growing inequality, not just between nations, but also within nations. Um, and you know, wage shares have fallen, profit shares have risen, capital mobility alongside labor immobility has reduced the bargaining power of organized labor. So much so, I don't know how much you've been following what is happening just across the lakes in, in Wisconsin, there is an attempt not, not to lower the benefits of public sector workers. You know, you could argue if there is a problem, everybody has to chip in. Here, what we're talking about is essentially to strip them of the right of collective bargaining, which is a totally different proposition altogether. A right most of us thought had been fought for and won a century ago, you know, and here we are in 2011 with this uh, proposition on the table. And I would like to, to pick up something that John said on sort of the uh, intellectual bankruptcy that many of these debates uh, show. You know, I, I confess to you I'm a, a follower and reader of uh, Farid Zakaria. I think he is one of the most uh, intelligent commentators we have around. He has a wonderful program on Sundays in, on CNN, a GPS, which brings together extraordinary top speakers from around the world. Um, but even somebody like him falls into this trap of believing that, for example, the problem faced by the United States, and he has been saying this over and over again, is because of its high taxes. And that if only the United States could lower its taxes, then everything will be okay. Well, one reason the United States is facing enormous deficits and it's unable to pay its bills, it's not because its taxes are too high, it's because the taxes are too low. The tax intake in the United States is 28%. For most countries in, in Europe, in Canada, we're talking over 40%. That's what you need to run a modern economy. So the notion that somehow by lowering your tax intake even more, it will bring progress and you will bring this, you know, most people would say, not at all. Something like Brazil, is doing very well, its tax intake at an income level that is probably not worth what it is in the United States, is 35 So what we have is a situation which globalization has unleashed, what we refer to as the, the forces of uncivil society. And in earlier information, the title was globalization of uncivil society. And uh, that's too much jargon. The dark side is a bit, uh, is a bit better. The challenge then, of course, and the question becomes, what can developing countries do to confront the challenges of globalization? And you know, there are different views on this. You know, one view is that basically what you have to do is to lower all barriers, to eliminate all capital controls, and then things will happen and um, you know, kingdom will come. There are countries in Latin America, my part of the world, Ecuador, El Salvador, which adopted the dollar, the US dollar, as their currency, as a way to fight inflation. But of course, it means that one less economic to handle uh, your economy. Uh, again, it's a difficult choice. I mean, you don't want autarky. You don't want to become Myanmar or North Korea in isolating yourself totally from what's happening in the world. Uh, on the other hand, if we simply open yourself up, eliminate all barriers, 
have it down and no one has to do it over. The objective is not to have to deny that. But if it's actually a good thing, it's and eliminating all obstacles for the waves of globalization uh, to come through. And what we do in the book is to examine how these forces of uncivil society uh, have taken over in a number of, of places uh, around the world. But let me give you an example. In addition to being uh, ambassador to India, was also ambassador to Sri Lanka uh, during the time of the war, of the civil war, 25-year-old war. Now, the uh, Tamil Tigers were a high-tech operation. They were able to draw funds all over the world. And they were able to one terrorist to the airport and to the Navy uh, that were able to keep the Sri Lankan state in bay for 25 years. Among other things, because of the technological. Um, another case, of course, is the case of jihadis. Jihadis uh, use their websites very effectively to recruit followers and uh, But they also have very effective getting money around. In a way that cannot be protected. You know, one reason is that some of the other things that are in the state, other things, some of the phones are dead, but they also mean that they are very easily protected. The reason Jonas Savimbi was found and killed in a door in 1999. of things on um, some of the points that have been made, that have been made by, by John and by, and by Will. Uh, again, you get this very odd notion about what globalization means. Um, for a number of years, an, an early book of mine was on, on Latin America. It's called Which Way Latin America Hemispheric Politics Meets Globalization, and also based on a CG conference. And our take on what was happening in the region. The, the conference was held in 2006, the book came out in 2009, was a very upbeat, identifying positive trends. And we got a lot of flack, and people said, you're, you're totally wrong. Latin America is going down the drain. It's in, in the hands of populists that are you know, wreaking havoc. Um, nothing good can come out of this. And then came the Great Recession, 2008-2009, in Latin America did extremely well. As opposed to Europe, many countries are bankrupt, as opposed to our neighbor here down south, which is still in great difficulties. So again, there was a profound lack of intellectual understanding of what globalization means. And Latin America, one reason it came out well of the Great Recession is because it managed to grasp early on, particularly South America, that the action was in Asia and established very strong business relations, trading relations with Asia. A country like Chile, 40% of the exports go to Asia. Only 20% go to, go to the United States. So here you have some, some very fascinating things. And let me, let me end and so we can get into the, the discussion, into the Q&A with one, one comment on a, a bit of a pet subject of mine, which is the relationship between political science and, 
and economics. One of the most fascinating things I had to observe was when in uh, 2009, Elinor Ostrom, a distinguished political scientist, former president of the American Political Science Association, chairman of the Department of Political Science at the University of Indiana, which he has been for 30 years, received the Nobel Prize in Economics. And the coverage in the media was, well, she started out as a political scientist. But it's not that she started out. That is what she is. That is what she does. That is her work. But what happened, of course, is that given what was happening and had happened in the world at the time, giving the Nobel Prize of Economics to somebody who had argued that supply and demand will take care of itself, we don't need to do anything, as some people had suggested, wasn't exactly on the table, which is why somebody like Eleanor Ostrom, who's done pioneering work, and in areas of this as the interface between political science and economics, but from a political scientist perspective, won the, the Nobel Prize. So, there's still some hope. Thank you very much. And we will now, we will now pick up some, some questions. Or should we have a, I thought we are going to have a conversation first. <laughs> so, okay. Can I make sort of two comments first? Or is this on? Yeah. I, I just, uh, I, I mean, I think there's two, it's, it's, it's a very confusing time, really. I mean, that's what's great about it, you know, if you're not suffering. Um, uh, it's true that there is an enormous amount of, there, uh, probably principally because of the technology, new kinds of connections. Um, but, you know, you're absolutely right that the United States has created a kind of virtual empire with military bases and not owning, not having the territories. So that, in a way, is a new kind of, of empire. It's quite, a, you know, I guess it's a bit like a, a gigantic version of, of Venice or something like that. But What's, what's fascinating is that I, I haven't seen any numbers on this, but I would guess, unless someone knows differently, that actually in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, there were far more people living outside of their countries than there are today. Because the number of people that took to run those land-based empires was gigantic. The number of British in India, the number of... And not only that, but the movement, gigantic movements of population of, you know, the British moving the Sikhs into Burma and into India. And the enormous movements of populations, far larger numbers of, for example, Westerners living abroad than there are today. I would think probably a multiple of 10 times more Westerners mm -hmm. living abroad than there are today. So, you know, that sort of idea, and this isn't what either of my friends were saying, but I'm just trying to say it's so much more confusing than we think. This, this, the, the, in many ways, for worse perhaps, it was actually more international then because there was a larger number of people living outside of their countries then. A second related point, which has to do with movements of people also, which is that, that, that the, the migration and immigration patterns of today are actually smaller than they were at the beginning of the 20th century. Canada today is taking 1% of our population, if we're lucky, somewhere around 250 to 300,000 people a year. In the first decade of the 20th century, we were taking about 350,000 people a year with a population of 5 million. I mean, those are facts. I mean, I may have them slightly wrong in terms of getting the years slightly out or a few hundred, uh, tens of thousands. But the, the, the movement of population in the late 19th century, early no, no. 20th century, was gigantic no, compared you're quite right. today. No, huh? what, what I was saying is no, that... No, no, I'm not disagreeing. I'm precisely just, you know. that on population movements, now it's very restricted. I mean, yeah. that's the one thing yeah. with globalization is not operating. Yeah, know? no, exactly. And, it's, and in a way, what's happening in Canada is this tightening up, you know, of immigration and refugee policy has to do with the extent to which globalization has curiously led to an increasing level of fear of the other. I mean, look at Europe. I mean, you go to the south of France. I know France, the country I kind of know best outside of Canada. South of France, if people say they're goal wall, it's complete nonsense. I mean, the south of France is made up of, of uh, Italians, uh, uh, Spaniards and North Africans who came at the late 19th century and the first half of the 20th century leading up to the end of the Civil War in Spain. And, you know, now they're all French. 
So there's, there's a long history of movements of, of people. What, um, the, the, the other thing that just has to be said, and I think it ties into your ideas of the negative side, the, ne the dark side, <clears throat> is to simply stand back and look <clears throat> at what's happening, which is to say that a movement which was supposed to be about opening up has in fact led, I think, directly and indirectly, to a rebirth of old-fashioned nationalism. I mean, what we've seen in the last 25 years, for good reasons and bad reasons, is an astonishing return of nationalism, negative nationalism and positive nationalism. A great deal of what you're seeing in North Africa today is in fact a return of nationalism. It may be good nationalism, we don't know yet, you know, but certainly, you know, when I started writing about this kind of stuff, I would talk about the return of nationalism, and then I would start talking about the return of populism. And now I'm obliged to turn, talk about the return of racism. In the last five to ten years, racism has become socially acceptable again. It's absolutely appalling. I mean, you can actually, as, a, as an academic or as a writer, you say, actually, ten years ago, you couldn't say that, and now you can say it. Now you can be a racist again. You can get elected as a racist. You can run a country as a racist. You know, Italy has had as a deputy prime minister a fascist who may soon be the prime minister. You know, France, I don't know, call it what you want. Hungary, you know, you start looking around and say, hey, how did that happen? I thought we were opening up. I thought nationalism was dying. Suddenly globalization has brought racism back, populism back, neo-fascism back at the national level, and borders are closing down only partly because of fear of, you know, Al-Qaeda. It's actually closing down to a great extent because of the return of this kind of what I would call old-fashioned negative nationalism. And that was an unintended effect of globalization led by a kind of dehumanized idea of economics. Well, well, would you like to comment on that? Yes, I would. <laughs> I, I, I agree with all of the things that, that was said, but I... I in the, in the field in which I work, which is globalization studies, this is one of the issues that we pay particular attention to. Why is it that at a time where transplanetary connections among people are increasing, we're also finding uh, an, a rise in, in nationalist movements, uh, minority, cultural minorities in different countries, where are we finding religious fundamentalism, for example, is a relatively new phenomenon. If you, if you look at uh, the nature of of modern-day uh, religious fundamentalism, because there's sociologists of religion, Roland Robinson, I think, has written on this the best, is a well-known globalization author. So as part of, that is, as people become more connected, they also end up uh, wanting to assert themselves, like, who are we in this kind of situation? I also think that when it comes to immigration, uh, there were clearly uh, large movements of people around the end of the 19th century until to the, or just before the start of the First World War. And there are significant movements of people today. But one thing that we have to remember, there are two things about it, at least from a Canadian perspective, that are important. The situation of an immigrant from China today, living in Toronto. We compare that to her ancestor who might have even come 50 years ago. She's in a completely different situation because of globalization. She is in contact with China on a daily basis through the internet. She can travel there more easily. She can speak to, to people there by telephone. So the immigrant experience is one that is also different because you, you almost might say that immigrants oftentimes live in a kind of transnational space. They're in Canada, but in some ways, they haven't left China either. And so that people from India or China, when they come to Canada, they remain as mo much more connected with their homeland, which complicates their identity, and it comp comp complicates the reaction of other Canadians to them. But another phenomenon about Canadian immigration, if you look at it, what is interesting about it, if you look at the two largest immigrant populations in Canada over the past while, the Chinese from mainland China and those from South Asia, 75% of them have settled in two cities, Toronto and Vancouver. And, you know, I grew up in the Okanagan Valley in rural British Columbia. 
I go back there to visit my mother every summer, sometimes more often than that. The Okanagan Valley is still very white. There are some minorities there, but it isn't that much change. A lot of, a lot of Sikhs, actually, buying up, the, uh, buying up the cherry farms <laughs> and things, which the, the white guys don't want to farm anymore. It's quite interesting to see the Sikhs in but the Okanagan. But relative, you know, when, when we're talking about the, the relative Statistics Canada has estimated that in 1917 in Canada, in Vancouver, 23% of the population will be of Chinese origin. And in Toronto, they're estimating that of the 4.2 million people that will be living in metropolitan Toronto at that time, 1.8 million will be South Asian. So what I'm trying to say is that the experience of globalization, even within Canada, is very different. In Penticton, where I grew up, there may be Sikhs buying a few orchards, but we're not talking about the vast numbers there. And the connection of people they don't settle in Canada in the same way because they remain connected in, in other ways to their homeland. So people have more complicated identities. The old national identity that we talked about, sociologists have studied and show that if you ask people who they are, they'll list off a number of different things. And maybe being Canadian might, often, might, often, might not even be near the top of that list. So some things have happened that have changed some of the phenomena that were important in the 19th century, but made them different today. So just a, a last comment on yes. that. I mean, I, you know, we're agreeing and disagreeing all the way through this. I mean, I think a lot of what you're saying is very exact. I think it's too bad you took the Chinese example, because of course, that was a particular example of early 20th century immigration to Canada with a handful of others where racism was in play and, you know, elimination of people, but, uh, or marginalization of people and mistreatment of people. But the, the interesting thing is that, that those enormous waves of immigration in the 19th century, second half of the 19th century, but all through the 19th century in Canada and the first half of the 20th century, the groups who were not, uh, who did not suffer from racism in that way, actually, um, how shall I put this? Um, today, when you immigrate, yes, you have a more complicated thing because you can get on the phone or Skype Skype for nothing, right? Uh, on the other hand, people actually uh, integrate <coughs> uh, at many levels much, much faster than they did in the 19th century. It was absolutely the standard because people went rural in the 19th century. You know, Ukrainians, Swedes, uh, uh, Icelanders. I mean, you just go down this poles, you go down the list, but also the Northern Irish Protestants in this enormous list. They actually went into farming communities where for two to three generations they lived among themselves and in a way retained, be, re remained to a great extent what they were. And it wasn't until third, fourth generation that they started running for politics and doing degenerate things like writing books and becoming professors and painting paintings, right? But they, was, they were very much within themselves. And actually the communication for many of those societies was very, very interesting. One shouldn't forget the mail worked, uh, the telegraph worked, Political leaders traveled. I mean, you mentioned China. In the, in the, uh, I mean, and compared it to Tunisia. I mean, Chiang, um, uh, Sun Yat-sen raised a large amount of his money for his revolutions by coming through Canada <coughs> and the United States. One forgets how complicated all of that was. And to this day, you know, when the president of Iceland comes to Canada, he always goes to Manitoba because half the population of Iceland is in Manitoba. You know, it's, it's so. I mean, all of this is. What's fascinating is that it, it is, had, it has always been complicated and people are finding new ways to have, and I would agree with you, how, how to live with multiple personalities, multiple loyalties, but I think it's always been that way in Canada. It, but interestingly enough, on the surface, people integrate faster than they've ever integrated, in spite of the, the internationalism that so you're describing. I'm, I'm reminded of the, this actually happened in the 1840s. Lord Palmerston, who was then foreign secretary in Britain, uh, got news that the telegraph was at work. And he said, my God, this is the end of diplomacy. Well, <laughs> it wasn't. So you know. uh, anyway, we've got some uh, questions now. And uh, we'll address them, and then we'll take some more. Um, Adam from Kitchener, based on Professor Colesman's description of globalization, it seems that this process necessitates the exploration and expansion of fuel power. 
But say that again. Um, it seems that the process necessitates the exploration and expansion of fuel power. My two questions are, are we at the mercy of technology to fix the problem of escalating greenhouse gases that stem from globalization? And two, is our current global mode of wealth creation, globalization, putting our way of life at risk unless technology can address our fuel consumption problem? We were talking this morning with uh, Professor Coleman about the significance of energy security and energy issues in today's world. According to some people, the energy issue may at some point become more significant than globalization as an issue for our planet. So, Will, small question. <laughs> it's more an answer than a question. <laughs> yes. you know, I don't think there's much. I mean, it's a good question because yes. it, it answers itself. It's a mini essay. Yeah. I think that um, in terms of the environment and whether or not the economic activity that we are engaging in is, is creating a situation that is increasingly difficult for us to handle as a, as a world, I think it's pretty evident that a lot of the environmental problems that we are facing are, are made by the actions of human beings whether it's our economic development, our other practices, and so on and so forth. And some of those things that we associate with globalization certainly have accelerated uh, some of the difficulties that we're having in terms of that. And um, the difficulty we have, uh, I think, as a, as a world, is that uh, how do we solve these problems? And we have a prime minister of our country, for example, who says there isn't a problem. And there are other leaders like that who agree. And we know that the problem can't be solved without working together. Uh, that is, sometimes, somehow, we have to be working together as a world. That, that it's very difficult to solve some of the most serious parts of the problem without doing that. That's why we have a program of global governance at the Balsoli School of International Affairs, because it, that's really the problem. How do you govern the globe? And, and so, is technology the answer? Uh, most people would say it's part of the answer, but it's certainly not all of it. And I'm not a, a real expert in this area, and, and so on and so forth, but I, I think that a lot of the processes that we associate with globalization uh, are certainly accelerating some of the difficulties that we have in the environment, both in the air, the sea, the water, and so on. And so forth. I mean, I think, I, think it's yes. just, I think it's just, this is a very, very simple and good example of what I was talking about, which is that a movement which was meant to be um, future-oriented and new was actually so old-fashioned and so linear. It couldn't actually imagine its way out of an, uh, an energy trap. It could only see itself moving forward in this linear manner. And, you know, there have been endless opportunities to just sit back and say, wait a minute, why are you doing this sort of, I don't know, fruit and vegetable shop form of economics uh, about, uh, about uh, energy? I mean, why would you think that the new forms of energy were costs when they could be ways of making money? I mean, and to this day, we're still dealing with essentially economic models coming, which come out of the 19th century and have been embraced by globalization which actually treat uh, new forms of energy as a cost, as opposed to saying that, you know, you know, Europe became rich to a great extent for the wrong reason after the Second World War, which is it was knocked down and it rebuilt itself. Rebuilding is a way to make money. They can't even imagine that rebuilding in a new way is a way to make money, not a cost. And I, I mean, I, I can I give you two examples of this very fast. In, in the first energy crisis, I was a a child genius idiot um, as the assistant to the then first chair of Petro Canada, Maurice Strong, who is a brilliant man, he is a brilliant man, and uh, we belong to something called the Workshop for Alternative Energy Strategies, which brought together the heads of the big energy companies around the world. So there was the head of, you know, uh, the nuclear, whatever it is in France, and uh, uh, General Motors, which was the biggest company in the world at the time, and, and Maurice Strong was there as the head of Petro Canada, and each one of them had a bag carrier, and I was the bag carrier you know, a 12-year-old bag carrier kind of thing. And, um, 
And so when the big men were having meetings, the little bag carriers would have meetings. And I remember being at a meeting where a bunch of, you know, northern Europeans with cars that went so many miles to the kilometer, double or triple, whatever, the United States and Canada, said to the head of research, who was the bag carrier of, of General Motors, said, well, why don't you just increase the mileage? The, the mileage. Just increase the mileage. I mean, no, the, I don't know, the Swedes were saying that. And the guy just stood up, and he looked like a perfectly normal sort of guy, and he stood up and he said, we don't want to. And there was this incredible silence, like 40 brilliant young men and women, men mainly, unfortunately, but um, sort of said, what do you mean you don't want to? He said, well, we don't want to. We're not going to. And if you probably examined it, you'd find that, you know, there were people from the oil companies on the boards of the car companies. I don't know. And the fact they didn't do it, and now they're doing it because they're desperate. But it took total despair. And the other tiny example is the whole of northern Canada, the most expensive thing in running those communities, which I know pretty well, is that they have to ship in the fuel every year by barge or very more, even more difficultly by truck or whatever. And this is fuel oil to heat these communities. Now the fact is most of these communities have sun 24 hours a day half the year. Does that sound like solar six months of the year? And they have, a lot of them have wind. They could be burning their own garbage to produce the heat. None of this has to, this money does not have to be spent. This pollution does not have to happen. But the standard economic models of, of the 19th century, which are the models of globalization, have forced these communities to remain in order to fund themselves within this old-fashioned model. Very good. <laughs> one, one question, um, Alexander from Kitchener to John Ross and Saul. If the neoliberal conceptualization where, where is he? Of where is growth, Alexander? He is, must be somewhere. <laughs> Of growth is yeah, but he's somewhere. Is increasing GDP is incorrect or at least incomplete. What is a better understanding of economic growth? Well, I mean, it's it, again, it's. Where did this go? They're very strange. I mean, they're quite good, but they're. Um, you know, it, it, again, I think it's happening. There are people who've done some of this work. We've known for a quarter of a century that GDP and all these inf inflation counts, growth counts, are all based on completely outdated models. That what we count to know what inflation is, is preposterous. I mean, in Canada, I believe, I, mean, I may be wrong because I haven't looked at this in a while, I believe we count the building of new houses, but not renovation. So, to, you know, there are things like that, they're just lunacy. And you, you know, people go out and they say, but the price has gone up, but it, it doesn't show in the inflation figures doesn't show in the cost figures. So there's an enormous need to simply go back and it, this is what I was talking about. I was talking about integrated thought. You know, you actually have to bring all the costs together. You have to bring all the possibilities of new growth in wealth together. This is not that hard to do. We could make, you know, we could just take this room and we could, we could if, if you put the models that are being used today for GDP and put them on a table, we could probably break up into 10 groups and by the end of the evening, we'd have a new model. We've got through 30 years of globalization without this happening, which is why I say it's a very backward-looking movement. Let me just add a footnote to that. I mean, basically, the current model of economic growth that we use is one that uh, heavily discounts the future. Yeah. By not taking into account the cost we're imposing on future generations uh, and thinking that we are saving money by relying on, say, old-fashioned energy sources, we're making, of course, a big mistake, and we're leaving this debt uh, to our children and grandchildren, something I'm particularly conscious now that I have two grandchildren. Anyway, uh, we'll now take some uh, questions here from the uh, floor. Are there microphones for people? There are some mics over here. Only one person? My goodness. <laughs> please. I'll start. Go ahead. Can you identify yourself, please? Uh, my name is Paul Nidger. I'm from Kitchener. So back in 1999 and 2001, as you were mentioning, like the battle for Seattle and all, and like the Quebec City protests, and at that time there were strong sentiments that these multilateral agreements and multinational corporations were going to leave people a, a lot poorer. And that's not the sense that you know, I'm getting in today's uh, talk, you were talking about, you know, China and India and living standards going up and so on and so forth. Um, so to what degree 
were all of these people protesting wrong or right? And what evidence do we have for that 10 years later? That's right. So were those who bought, who fought the Battle of Seattle right? That is the question. Will? Well, I think that uh, um, it was already pointed out by John Rawson Saul that, and by Jorge himself, that one of the phenomena that we see is that um, inequality has actually increased over the past uh, 20 years and certainly has continued to increase over the past decade. And that inequality is not only between countries, but within countries. So if you look at inequality in Canada, for example, those people who are, are poor, as defined by the uh, statistics scanner or whatever, have actually increased proportionately to the population. And the city that I live right now, Hamilton, has the highest rate of poverty, for example, in Canada right now. And I see it every day. Mm. So, uh, and you can go from country to country, and that what, is, what seems to have happened is that despite the fact that GDP growth has increased, and it's increased spectacularly in China and India, who has benefited from that growth isn't very evenly spread. And so that in China, for example, you have emerged now a very, very wealthy elite group who are earning billions of dollars uh, in, in a country supposedly uh, using a socialist approach to capitalism. But uh, so I think that inequality has increased. One of the things, though, I think we have to be really careful about is to avoid blaming globalization for everything because what it does is it lets our own politicians in each of our countries off the hook. You know, the kind of inequalities that uh, Jorge was pointing out in the United States, where the level of gap between the very wealthy and the very poor is just astonishing. That isn't necessarily the result of globalization. There are other countries who are just as wealthy as the United States in different parts of the world, particularly Europe, where they've kept, or in Japan, where they've kept that gap between the rich and the poor down. Why? Because they've spent and continued to invest in social policies. They haven't privatized a lot of different <coughs> social policies. So it's not as if there's sometimes that with globalization, you hear a political rhetoric that says, we're powerless. We can't do anything about it. But if you begin to look around the world, you can see that people in different places faced with similar problems are not all reacting the same. Yeah, I it's, think you're, you're absolutely right. And, and, and I, I mean, to, 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 to slightly alter it, I think that the more the politicians and, if you like, the elite structures bought into the argument of globalization, the more they argued that it was inevitable and therefore there was little that they can do, and this became a justification for doing away with whatever structures. So that it's true that in Europe you have not had quite such a breakdown and that's because you've had less of a buy-in to, to those arguments and therefore people, pol political leaders didn't act in, and bureaucrats didn't act in such a passive way. So I don't, think that, I don't think one can say that the people who were worried about standards of living were wrong uh, in the late uh, 20th century. Um, what we've seen is an incredible shifting around the world, an appalling return of poverty in, in the West. I mean, levels of... Dep it, what we found in Europe out of all of this is inc less inequality, but incredible levels of internal depression of where could we possibly go next. It hasn't, it hasn't produced an open door to go somewhere. That's what I find so interesting. For example, France, I've never seen the last five years, in fact, increasing in the last 10 years, I've never seen them so depressed about their possibilities. Italy, the same thing. Spain, the same thing. Just depressed that there's, no, there's nowhere to go. It's one of the reasons that you're getting a lot of the middle class kids uh, emigrating, you know, because they just feel that it's, even though they can go anywhere in Europe, it's just not working for them. But then the other thing is, you know, you have some winners, say in, in parts of China and India, you have real losers in China and India, and then you have whole lots of other countries outside of the West who are losers or have large numbers of losers. So that the whole thing hasn't produced a kind of balanced growth, interesting balanced growth 
of wealth for people. It's produced a sort of, as I say, a return to the middle of the 19th century in a way of some really rich people, some instability, some growth opportunities, and of course husbands and wives doing, both of them working very, very hard, long hours. The loss of, you know, the loss of little things that were one, like not working on Saturday. Now they're working on Saturday and many on Sunday. Sometimes families have four jobs, all unsecured. I mean, these numbers would just keep growing so that people aren't starving, but if they're working six and a half days a week with four jobs in a family, and that represents anything more than 2% of the population, this, in a country like Canada, this is a big problem, or in the United States. Okay. Next question. Uh, good evening. It's an interesting discussion. My name's Marty Wolf. I'm from Red Bay, which is on the Bruce Peninsula north of Sabo Beach. I'm down on business, as it turns out. My career has changed a few times over the years because of multinationals disappearing, making people in France sad, people in Kitchener sad. Anyway, you guys do this for a living. You get to sit around and talk and think. <laughs> you got her made. You're part of the elite. I don't know what to say. I think the world's getting to be a better place quickly. You think the world, what, sir? It's becoming a better place yes. quickly. I don't what? travel or read a lot. What is the question? No, no, it's an interesting comment, actually. Is the world a better place now than it was 10 years ago? You guys travel on planes that consume an awful lot of fuel. Mm -hmm. A lot of people travel, they don't immigrate, they go on tours. Yeah. Will? I, I think it's very difficult to, I mean, it's a good question, but I, I think it's very difficult to ask, answer the question, uh, is the world a better place than it was 10 or 15 years ago? I'm not sure how I can answer it. I, I think there are some people different parts of the world that would say, yes, they're better off today. I mean, there is a larger middle class in India, for example. Uh, there is uh, there's more social policy in Chinese cities. Uh, they're making changes like that. Uh, and in the, other, in the other areas, you'll find also, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, tremendous, tremendous difficulties. I mean, associated with HIV AIDS and other kinds of things. But so I, I think that, uh, Hmm? Yes, we, we, can, we can't hear you. We can repeat it. What? what? Yeah, but that's, that's coming... Well, he's saying that the farmers in Africa are learning how to let things grow back and so on. I mean, there are small things happening which are wonderful, you know, and there's no question that, for example, the Chinese government has decided that environmentalism is very important and it's moving in a very interesting direction. Sure, there are, why would someone think that everything's going in one direction? Things are going in multiple directions at the same time. Um, and you go to, you know, you, I, I, as I said, I was in Egypt just before the, the, the change of regime, and you saw this astonishing mixture of a very, very, you know, one of the oldest sophisticated civilizations in the world, a very rich, fantastically international elite. Frankly, the elites in some of those countries are far more sophisticated than in our countries, but it's not necessarily for the right reasons, but they're incredibly well-educated, speaking four or five languages, uh, moving around the world. But then you, you, know, you, you, you went out, as I did, with, uh, with people to other parts of Cairo, and you saw poverty which was worse than it was in the 1960s and 70s when I was in countries like that. It had actually gone downhill since then. So, I mean, you know, it, it, what's so interesting is that there's been this promise, which was a promise that we were going in a certain direction. In fact, we've gone in multiple directions at the same time, and it's led to a great deal of instability in large parts of the globe. We're, we're now in one of the most unstable periods since, I don't know, the 1930s, probably. And, and that's why you're seeing blow-ups all over the place and a return of levels of violence, which were unexpected, yeah. Let me based on frustration. Sorry. But the frustration is coming at the end of the globalist period. To be fair, it's important to keep in mind the following. You know, if we ask it's what, sorry? Uh, if, the, if we ask ourselves, are we in a better place, in a better world today? I would argue strongly that for a large number of people around the world, there are more opportunities today than there were, say, 50 years ago. 
But at the same time, for those who do not take advantage of those opportunities for a variety of reasons, in many ways, it's a worse place. You know? So the stakes have been raised. You, know? you can do very well, or you can do very, this is true for individuals, I would argue, it's also true for countries. A country like Singapore, like Chile, that makes the most of globalization, can do quite well. But a country in Central Africa and West Africa that doesn't find a niche is in a real problem. I think we have time for one last question. Hi, my name is Dustin McDonald, and I'm a student at Wilfrid Laurier University. I'm not very good with you. A student of mine, a very good yes. one, I must say. <laughs> I'm not very good with names, but the gentleman on the left side, you were talking earlier about the failure of globalization in regards to Tunisia and Egypt. I'm just wondering if you could clarify your position on how you see that as a failure of globalization. Well, if you were living in, in, in many countries which are described as being developing or, I mean, what would be the right words? Um, Merging. Emerging, emerging, developing, well, I mean, in, for a in, series in of In the words. global south. Hmm? In the global south. Yes. So they were, in a sense, assigned a role inside globalization, which suggested that if they did a certain number of things, it would lead to a certain kind of success. And the experience in most of those countries was that it did not lead to that kind of success. It led to, you know, they were always poor, but there's, there's, you know, and I don't want to be romantic, I'm not being romantic about different kinds of poverty, but you, you, you can move from a sort of stable poverty, which is say, maybe perhaps a, a peasant economy, to um, uh, a lumpen proletariat poverty of instability uh, in the slums around cities. So a large part of this period had people moving from one kind of poverty to another kind of poverty. Now, if you were doing the numbers on growth, of course, suddenly they had an income, whereas when they were, when they were uh, uh, poor farmers, they had no income. So they didn't even show up on the charts. But funnily enough, they were eating. But once they got into the slums, even if they were making 50 cents, you know, the, the one dollar or the two dollar calculation, they're suddenly making 50 cents. Suddenly the World Bank says, oh look, you know, they're richer than they were. Well, actually, they're probably eating less well, they're probably poor, they're much more unstable. Uh, they're in greater difficulty. They may have a chance of getting out of those slums, but that isn't what's been happening in the last 30 years. So that kind of frustration, uh, which was then tied to uh, dictatorial regimes, which were approved of by the international system, which, you know, I'm not blaming globalization, but the period of globalization somehow approved of these dictators for whatever reasons. So the two things combined led to enormous levels of frustration and the attempts at change that you're seeing now. I, I take your point with, uh, with poverty and inequality, and I, I know North Africa is not the only area in the world that ever experienced gross inequality. I mean, Brazil is probably a perfect example for that. Um, the protests that have been taking place, though, however, in, in Tunisia and Egypt and, and Yemen and Iran and now uh, in Libya, couldn't you also say on the, other, on the other side, globalization has actually helped to facilitate it through the transnational age that, transnationalization of ideas and the use of the internet, Facebook, and Twitter to help spread these ideas, to help free these people from the oppression that they would otherwise be suffering under without a globalized world? It's a lovely argument. Um, so there are two, really two elements in it. One is technology, and the other is globalization. Um, actually, these are national movements. They're North African movements. They're movements within the Arab, Arabic-speaking world. Uh, so in a sense, it's, they're actually very old fashion, traditional, uh, you're, you're seeing a movement within an old region. Uh, it has absolutely nothing to do with globalization. Nothing to do with globalization. Of course, it has something to do with technology because it's easier to spread the word of what's happening. But that's got nothing to do with theories of, of, of globalization. It has to do with people having cell phones. But time, time Very good. We, we are at the end of our time. Sorry. Thank you. Very good. Well, Great please join me, join me in thanking our, our speakers who have given us such a tour de force. Mm. Uh, it was very good. Thank you very much, John. Yes, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you to our audience. Thank you to the people with questions, including uh, the first questions we heard from our webcast audience. Uh, thank you to Jorge Heine, uh, William Coleman, and John Ralston Saul for a 
a stimulating discussion uh, on the dark side of globalization. And you know, it's such a, a broad topic. If you can talk about immigration and music and economics and everything in, in one conversation, uh, what isn't touched by globalization really? So sometimes hard in a conversation to see the string among all the pearls. Uh, but I, I heard a lot tonight that was very interesting to me from hearing globalization described as really a 19th century and stifling sort of a, a system of thought um, to uh, the, the transplanetary uh, connections among peoples and, uh, and all the ways that affects us from the immigrant experience to the way we uh, buy our gasoline and, and really the problem being one of, uh, of ideas and imagination and we certainly heard some ideas and, and some imaginative ideas tonight. Um, and it was pointed out that, uh, you know, innovations and in governance uh, may not be the solution to all these problems. They will require many thoughtful people in, in many realms working on them. But, uh, but at CG, we do believe that innovations in international governance can help uh, lead to greater prosperity and peace and sustainability for people everywhere on the planet. Uh, so just uh, a thank you to all of you for your insights. It was very interesting. And uh, a few brief notes for our audience just before we adjourn. Uh, the video from tonight's live webcast will be edited and posted to CG's website. So you can uh, share that with friends who weren't able to be here. And also, if you wish to sign up for CG's regular newsletter sent by email and called CG Worldwide, our volunteers are available in the lobby to help you with that. Uh, I thank our public event sponsors once again, 570 News and Wordsworth Books. And please do visit our book, excuse me, our book tables in the lobby where you can buy a signed copy if maybe our authors and co-editors would be willing to sign copies there. Uh, the books, the two books that you heard mentioned tonight are going for an event special price of only $20 each, which is a considerable discount from what you would find in the stores. Finally, please mark your calendars for our next two events coming up in April. On Friday, April 8th, we present Professor Anatole Levin, Chair of International Relations and Terrorism Studies at King's College in London, England. Uh, Professor Levin will be speaking about Pakistan, a hard challenge for international governance. And on Wednesday, April 27th, we present a highly distinguished panel of four, I won't name them all, uh, but it includes a visitor from the International Red Cross in Geneva in conversation on the topic beyond 2015 development goals for the world. All the details about those events are posted on the CG website. So thank you again for coming to CG tonight and please have a safe journey home.